chance. <laughs> is it a new thing? Is it, you know, something that is infiltrating into church? I've had calls, I've had DMs, I've had young people posting me questions, um, asking me to add my voice to the discussion on chants and the like. And I feel the need as a player within the space to shed some light on, on the chant conundrum, if you will. Now, the first thing I need you to understand is that the chant is not new to the church. The church has known chants ever since the Middle Ages. In fact, chants and hymns are like cousins. No, they are actually brother and sister. <laughs> they were introduced to the church in the same dispensation, right? In the Middle Ages, uh, Pope Gregory was the head of the church. And when we say church in the Middle Ages, it was basically the Catholic church, right? And in that dispensation, the church saw so much revival, and yet there was so much corruption happening in the church as well. And to deal with this tension between revival and um, corruption, Pope Gregory introduced a concept called monasticism, right? He sent monks into monasteries to engage in long hours of prayer for the church and humanity, right? Now, to help these monks lose sense of time so that they can engage in long hours of prayer, um, the musicologists developed these musical modes called the Gregorian chant. And they introduced that to the monks so that they can engage in long hours of prayer and lose sense of time. In that same dispensation, to deal with the corruption, I remember I said the church was dealing with corruption and there was, it was, there was also revival in that dispensation. To deal with the corruption, um, the church introduced hymns, right? And hymns were to teach doctrine, right? And to combat wrong doctrine. So to um, combat the wrong doctrine that was going on in the church, they deployed hymns and to um and to and to go into prayer and intercession the soundtrack they they deployed um the chants so whereas hymns was taking care of the doctrinal issues the chants was taking care of the prayer and the prophetic movement so if you love your hymns please do not um victimize do not demonize the chants they are actually brother and sister and I say this to say that if you study um, church history, you find out that in every dispensation, there seems to be um, some sort of highlight, highlight plays on one form of music or the other, so that the purpose of God for that dispensation will be accomplished. You can call that soundtracks to the move of God. In the awakenings, right, the Middle Ages, then we come to the awakenings, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and the third great awakening. In the first great awakening, hymns was the, uh, you know, soundtrack for that movement, right? Um, we saw the rise of um, Isaac Watts, who basically was in charge of liturgical hymns. What his task was, was to write hymns that would teach sound biblical doctrine, right? And then there was the, you know, the evangelists, the Wesleys, the Charles and the John Wesleys. They typically wrote evangelical hymns. So liturgical hymns and evangelical hymns were the soundtracks for um, the first great awakening. Now, if you come to the second great awakening, you will see that there is highlight on um, folk music, you know, um, the music, the indigenous music of the people, right? So in America, you see that the indigenous music of America was what the Lord used to spark that awakening. If you come to the third great awakening, which was spearheaded by Charles Finley, Charles Finley was a lawyer turned preacher. The soundtrack for that movement, for that revival was Sunday school songs. Can you believe it? And in that dispensation, um, the Lord needed the church to be taught discipleship. So songs like read your Bible, pray every day, those kind of, you know, Sunday school songs was what God used to, uh, to be the catalyst for that movement, the third great awakening. Time will not even permit me 
to go into the gospel era, Dwight Moody and Ara Sankey, the singing evangelist, and also look at, you know, the Welch Revival, the Azusa Street Revival. If you study all of these um, dispensations of the church, you will see that music played prominent, you know, part in those dispensations. And in every dispensation, there was some kind or type of music that is highlighted for what God is doing. Now, let me even take you to the 1960s, to the Jesus music movement spearheaded by Lonely Frisbee um, and the hippies. Um, and in fact, that movement gave rise to what now has been known as contemporary gospel music. It used to be called contemporary Christian music then, CCM. And in that dispensation, that was when we saw the rise of bands, right? Um, um, these things that, you know, the newsboys and all of those things that came to be. It started in the 60s, the 1960s. And in that dispensation, music was prominent in the move of God. What I'm saying is for every move of God, there's going to be a highlight on some form of music that will carry the move of God. They become like soundtracks to the move of God in that dispensation. The reason I believe that the chants are back is because I believe God is calling this, this us in this dispensation. God is calling us in this dispensation to go back to the prayer closet, to go back to monasticism, right? To go back to the dispensation where the chants were invented. What was it used for? It was used to engage in long hours of prayer. So if we see the chance coming back, just maybe God is calling us to what the chance were used for when it was introduced to the church. And that was basically prayer. So the chance, if you ask me, are back because God is calling us to prayer. It's the soundtrack for the prayer and the prophetic movement. God bless you.